First, uh, Happy New Year to everyone, and uh, this is our first event for the year. I hope that uh, all of you have had a promising start to the new year. Uh, today's public forum is on the Rakhine Rohingya crisis, so this is our first, first event, and we have a number of other events coming up in the year. Uh, we actually have had this event in mind for uh, some time, and We've had actually this event planned for earlier, since uh, September, October, November, but we had some other intervening uh, forums, issues, teaching priorities, and so on. Uh, however, the good thing is that uh, uh, it's a kind of an ongoing situation that is not going to go away anytime soon. It's, uh, in some ways, it's also it's very difficult, it's intractable. Uh, I'm, I'm even reluctant to uh, to say too much about the Rohingya, because the Rohingya, is, the term Rohingya is also loaded. Some people um, do not accept this term, but of course uh, this term is, is what we know to be happening. The people who are suffering, uh, victimized in this uh, westernmost state of, uh, of Myanmar. And of course uh, there's a lot of controversies. Uh, Aung San Suu Kyi has been under, uh, under the gun, under a lot of pressure, uh, mounting criticism from the international community as to not doing enough, not doing anything to alleviate, mitigate the, the crisis that has unfolded and is still unfolding. Uh, we also have uh, the, the issues of the terrorism, you know, the Arakan, Rohingya, uh, Salvation Army uh, that uh, undertook uh, a, an operation uh, in late August that in turn elicited the clearance operations, clearance operations from the Tatmadaw, from the Myanmar army. So a lot of issues involved, uh, we're not going to solve them today, but uh, here in Bangkok at Chulang Khan University, we are interested in, in focusing, analyzing, uh, providing platforms and outlets and perhaps uh, ways forward for uh, policy issues, uh, issues that have policy implications by drawing in tapping expertise of uh, experts and of scholars, practitioners from the area. So here I am uh, today with a expert-studied lineup, uh, two journalists, uh, a professor and of course a, uh, a diplomat practitioner. Uh, you have their bios with you and I think the order we will go is we'll start with uh, Kun Kawi Jongki Tawon, my colleague, uh, uh, dear old friend uh, and also a veteran journalist. Uh, and then uh, we'll, he'll be followed by um, Ambassador uh, Leticia van der uh, who was on, who was the, an international member of the Kofi Annan-led uh, commission on, on uh, Rakhine State. And then uh, that will be followed by uh, Gwen, Miss Gwen Robinson, the chief editor of the uh, Nikkei Asian Review. Both Gwen Robinson and Gawi Jongki Tawan are senior members. Uh, of ISIS Thailand. And then uh, our last speaker will be uh, Ajahn Supang Chan uh, uh, who is an expert on migration. She's worked on these migration issues on different sides uh, over the decades. So, Pika we will start with you. Uh, Kun Kui, uh, he needs no introduction because it's difficult to say what he does. Uh, most recently, he was an editor of the Myanmar Times. And this is uh, quite uh, impressive because for a Thai uh, veteran journalist who is focused on regional affairs for almost four decades, uh, you know, in a kind of a retirement job, he chose to be to edit this uh, uh, quite considerable organization, news organization in, in Myanmar, uh, based in Yangon, the Myanmar Times. But uh, apart from that, he's also uh, he attends and speaks and presents papers at think tanks, workshops, and all kinds of uh, events. And he writes columns that you can see in regional newspapers. So, Pika Wee, uh, Myanmar, lots of issues in the context of you know, the Rakhine Rohingya crisis. And also, uh, you're an expert on ASEAN. Uh, what are the, the implications, how the Rakhine crisis has impinged on ASEAN dynamics and ASEAN coherence, centrality, please.
single chair anything. There's only one result. Concrete outcome that Singapore consider as a national interest and regional interest. National interest and regional interest combined. So you see active ASEAN chairmanship on rock time. Now, I'm pretty bored by saying that. I'm not the chair, but having followed ASEAN for a long time, I know exactly what in the mind of Singaporean chair. This is the second chair that Singapore faced the jackpot. In 2007, during the period of 2007 and 2008, the, the start of year, Singapore has to deal with suffering revolution. At the time, Singapore state in Myanmar is so small. Then in May, it was Nagis. You see the best of Singapore diplomacy. One very uh, less friendly, and the second part was friendlier. But this time, this year, from now on, they will have a uh, foreign minister uh, retreat soon. Singapore will be acting as a facilitator, bridge builder for ASEAN. Now, whether ASEAN, Myanmar, and the international community can work together or not, you will see. Because Singapore need to convince Aung San Suu Kyi, and at the same time have the confidence of Tatmadaw to make sure that ASEAN will be able to play appropriate role. Now, at the moment, it's very interesting, though. Uh, you have uh, three levels of engagement. Uh, what is happening today now is that you have bilateral engagement. Thailand, Singapore has uh, provided uh, some cash, humanitarian assistance. Malaysia, Indonesia also have done that. But I think uh, Singapore has uh, provided uh, assistance through uh, this is very interesting through AHA, ASEAN Humanitarian uh, Assistance Center. This will be the key mechanism if, if, I said if, Napido, the government accepted. Because at the moment, uh, there's only very few and very limited uh, things that uh, AHA can do because uh, officially AHA Center uh, need uh, bigger mandate. Uh, secondly, as I said, uh, at the regional level, I, do, I don't think uh, it has yet come about, but under Singapore chair, I think uh, ASEAN will have a substantial uh, plans to, to help uh, Myanmar, uh, particularly in Rakhine. Uh, thirdly, I think uh, it's also very important that uh, this year the engagement of Myanmar with ASEAN will be very, what I would call critical. Because it's critical, uh, only ASEAN can help alleviate it, uh, whatever criticism that uh, Myanmar is facing, particularly uh, Do Aung San Suu Kyi, and also the Tatmadaw. So i pretty confident that under Singapore, uh, leadership, engagement uh, with Myanmar on Rakhine will be very tangible. But I cannot tell you uh, what will be uh, some of the program, but what, what I can say is that uh, as an honest broker, I think Singapore and ASEAN will need to uh, maintain communications uh, with Suu Kyi and also with Tatmadaw without uh, the better understanding from the, these three parties, it would be difficult for ASEAN to venture uh, any further. Um, in the past, as you can see, uh, I, I want to refer to uh, ASEAN's uh, efforts uh, to help uh, Myanmar. Last year, November 19, was very critical for me. I, I was a, a reporter and I followed the meeting in the Yangon. Aung San Suu Kyi called up the meetings to brief the ASEAN's uh, foreign minister on the situation in Rakhine. That was very important because she took the initiative, called for a retreat. In ASEAN practice, retreat actually reserved for uh, 
so-called the pre-summit uh, meeting or pre-foreign ministerial meeting to exchange on sensitive issue. But she did call for the first time officially. So it sort of uh, broke the rule of engagement within ASEAN. I thought that was very good. It would start uh, a new protocol where you have ASEAN, a member who was willing to discuss its own internal issue, but it was not to be because it's only one time. It was supposed to have second time uh, last year in September, but uh, I don't think Aung San Suu Kyi was ready and also Tatmadaw uh, uh, was uneasy with uh, engagement uh, with outsider. So I think the, in the coming months, um, I expect that um, uh, ASEAN will sort of uh, try to set up a group. Uh, you can call it a friends of uh, Myanmar. You remember there's a, lo a lot of uh, group of friends uh, of Thailand, of Myanmar, of many other countries uh, in the past to help informally uh, track to 1.5 track trees and all that, try to keep the combination, uh, combina uh, uh, communications uh, going. So that much I think uh, is uh, very clear. And I think the at the moment, uh, two countries uh, are very important to Myanmar at this time, Thailand and Indonesia. I think Thailand uh, so far has done a good job. It has done a good job because it's played a very low profile. A lot of people thought that Thailand would do a lot more. No, Thailand will continue to play a very low profile because uh, it did not want to upset Myanmar by playing uh, much more. So every time Thailand uh, want to do something is ask for permissions, for access from both Tatmadaw and the Nebido government. So sometimes the Nebido uh, want certain things. Thailand uh, also have to refer to Tatmadaw. As you can see, uh, good relation between the NLD government and Tatmadaw are very crucial. And in fact, uh, Thailand will play a very important role, particularly in the soften the Tatmadaw attitude toward the internal crisis. Um, last year, there was a very crucial meeting between uh, Minong Lai during his visits to, to Thailand, I think, uh, in uh, August. Uh, he met uh, with all the senior Thai. And the Thai uh, has given few uh, suggestions to Minong Lai, saying that uh, you need to be a bit more open to international community. Don't be afraid. Uh, uh, the Thai military has long, long experience engagement with uh, international organization, UNSCR, ICRC, you name it. So the Thai suggestion, engage them. Don't be afraid. Uh, uh, you must control the narrative. Otherwise, uh, you will lose out. And I was very surprised to learn that Thailand gives such a uh, advice because Thailand in fact has a lot of problem in communicating with international community particularly the, uh, the Thai military leaders but in fact I think it was well taken. Secondly uh, I mentioned Indonesia. Indonesia has played a very critical role throughout uh, the crisis in the past uh, two years. I think uh, Indonesia will continue to play that role. Um, when you mention Indonesia, one more country that you also need to, uh, to refer, it is Malaysia, which has played a very uh, opposite uh, role, I would say, within ASEAN, within the context of uh, bilateral relations. So at the moment, anything uh, that both sides want to do, I mentioned that uh, um, Singapore would take a strong uh, uh, interest in making sure that ASEAN engagement with uh, Myanmar over or Rohingya come out concretely. But again, as I uh, mentioned, with ASEAN non-interference and ASEAN consensus base, uh, you need the support of all member countries. But I think under uh, Singapore leadership, Malaysia's uh, uh, position on Rohingya 
would be a little bit softer, not stronger. And I think with ASEAN engagement with Myanmar in the national community, uh, which in the views of NAPIDOR this year will reduce greatly. So it's important that NAPIDOR would have to give more focus to, to ASEAN and what is planned to do. I, I think this much I, I would say. Other than that, uh, I will wait for, for your question. Thank you very much. Piggy, I'm just going to ask a quick two questions as follow up. Uh, could, could this Rohingya crisis uh, really undermine, further undermine ASEAN, what remains of ASEAN unity centrality? There's a, not just a new chair, Singapore will be a chair, but also we have a new ASEAN Secretary General um, this year. Uh, you know, and that means uh, he might be more effective, you think? And uh, could, could the, how could this crisis be tackled from an ASEAN chairmanship uh, and also the, the new section? And then also, second, You've been working in Myanmar as a Thai from outside. What do you think is going on there? Very quickly. Well, I, I want to focus on ASEAN. Number one, the reason I mentioned Singapore because the role of the chair is very important indirect. For example, previous chair, Philippine, tried to run away from the issue. Singapore is not. Singapore is not run, running away. Singapore will confront the issue. He will manage, uh, Singapore will manage the issue. Sekjen from Brunei will not take high profile, will we be low profile, he would much focus on the uh, non-controversial aspect, try to uh, improve uh, the coordinations on humanitarians, try to promote uh, economic integration. In fact, uh, in one of his first interviews, he was focused on disaster man management within ASEAN and to improve the efficiency of AHA. Now, uh, the situation in Rakhine is very important this year, and I think, like it or not, it will dominate ASEAN discussion, no longer the South China Sea. Of course, Singapore also is a coordinator of ASEAN-China uh, relations until uh, the middle of this year, and then it will uh, give it to the Philippines. So, uh, Singapore has a lot of uh, uh, responsibility, but whether it will divide ASEAN, because a lot of uh, political uh, pundits have already mentioned that uh, uh, you're talking about uh, these uh, Muslim ASEAN vis-a-vis -vis Buddhist ASEAN. And I think this kind of uh, debate will probably heat up in the future if a country like Indonesia toughen its position. At the moment, uh, I think uh, you have to commend Indonesian government, uh, Jokowi and uh, his team, try to maintain the narrative that this is a crisis of uh, humanitarians in nature. But then so you will see the hardening of Indonesian's uh, position. If Indonesia reached the point like uh, Malaysia, then it will have serious implications on the ASEAN centrality and unity because uh, in the end, uh, Thailand as a, well, I, I, as a Myanmar neighboring country and also have accepted uh, refugees uh, from Rakhine. As you know, uh, at the moment, Thailand has been working very hard to uh, prosecute those who engage in human trafficking. And you probably remember uh, a couple of years ago, the uh, Thai's abuse of uh, Rohingyas, uh, uh, refugees uh, smuggling them, the discovering of the massacre in southern Thailand that have prompted Thailand to uh, prosecute those who engage in the human trafficking, mainly the, the Rohingya. That also has um, made Thailand uh, as a forefront in engaging Myanmar and the improvement of the uh, migrant worker in Thailand, particularly under this government, has already increased the confidence of the, of, of the uh, Thai of the Myanmar government to Thailand. That is why the role of Thailand and Myanmar, uh, the role of Thailand and Indonesia were very crucial. And again, I think uh, ASEAN centrality at the moment uh, will not be affected because uh, it has not yet become an ASEAN agenda. Uh, you, you know, South, East, uh, South China Sea become an ASEAN agenda, but so far uh, this issue has not. So. 
I, I would hope uh, to see how Singapore will approach it. I have to mention again, chair of ASEAN is the most important in tackling the issue of Rohingya. I believe that uh, at the moment, Singapore is the number one investor. Last year, investment in Myanmar was 8.2 billion, over 55%, over about 4.6 billion come from Singapore. So it's a new ball game from, from Singapore. So let us watch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, so the challenge is facing ASEAN uh, uh, ever daunting, and I think uh, this issue will be at the forefront. Uh, at least there's a very strong chair this year, Singapore, and Thailand will be chair next year. And also we have a, uh, Kim Chok Hoi, the new section uh, from Brunei, maybe he'll be more effective. Uh, now we come to Ambassador uh, Leticia uh, Vandenasam. Uh, Ambassador Vandenasam uh, is a senior veteran diplomat. Uh, she was a member of the uh, uh, advisory commission on Rakhine State, led by uh, a former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, and she also was ambassador to a number of uh, countries, including her first ambassadorship in Thailand in the late 1990s. Uh, she's very extremely illustrious and, and qualified. Uh, she also has uh, spent a lot of time uh, in uh, Rakhine State itself, in the areas in the northern Rakhine State, uh, Mongdor, uh, Batidong, I think, and uh, uh, all those trips and the recommendations of the commission. Uh, Leticia, what do you think uh, is, is going to happen to those recommendations? Are they being followed through? Has the situation worsened? What are the nature and drivers of this of this violence and uh, conflict? Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, two quick preliminary points. I, I represent only myself. Uh, the, the commission headed by Kofi Annan ended its work on the 25th of August when it handed over its report to um, Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, so it no longer exists, and uh, it has no position on many of the uh, issues that have happened since. Uh, so when I speak about that, I represent only myself. I am indeed was happily working for the Dutch government, uh, but I'm now uh, happily retired <laughs> and doing other things like this. Um, so I speak only for myself. Secondly, um, I'm not going to have time to deal with all that has happened since August. Um, and I, but I hope that this will come out in the discussion but, because I'd like to comment on it. Um, but I want to wake, make one thing clear, uh, and that is that I am um, as concerned as many others, including um, UN Secretary General Guterres, uh, UN um, Commissioner for Human Rights Zaid and others who are very worried about the serious crimes that have been alleged to have been committed as well as the continued denial um, by the Myanmar government and the armed forces. Um, but I will focus my presentation mostly on the Commission's work itself. Now what makes the Advisory Commission's report relevant? Many people have suggested that it's become irrelevant after, um, after uh, the 25th of August and the start of the attacks and the uh, sub subsequent exodus. Well, I mean, there are a number of reasons why it's relevant. First of all, the government of Myanmar commissioned it itself. There have been countless reports and even more recommendations over the years about what's happening in Rakhine State, but this was a report, a commission put together by Aung San Suu Kyi herself. She took, up, she, she took up contact with Kofi Annan very early on after she took over in March 2006. She recognized that the situation with Kain had become untenable and that new approaches were urgently needed. She particularly asked, and I think this was the right thing to do, Kofi Annan, to chair a commission that would look into the situation of not only the Rohingya, but of all ethnic communities and to find a way forward to improve the lives of everyone who lives in that state. And that indeed is the only approach possible, improving everyone's lives. That doesn't mean that the, 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 uh, the situation 
of the, that the highlighting of the situation of Rohingya as being very serious is not is 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 not necessary. It is necessary, but solution lies in a more inclusive approach. The commission was also essentially a Myanmar commission. It was owned by the government. Yes, it had international participation, but the internationals were the minority. It was six citizens of Myanmar, many with um, long and credible histories of engagement in um, in government, uh, in diplomacy, and in um, health and humanitarian assistance, and three non-citizens, of which I was one. It was not a UN initiative, as people seem to think, because it, you know, Kofi Annan was its head. It is not an international initiative. It is an um, initiative of Myanmar itself. And when Aung San Suu Kyi, in early September 2016, installed our commission, she urged us to be bold. And not only that, not she gave us terms of reference that clearly stated that our recommendations had to meet international norms and standards. Now, obviously, a lot can happen in a year. Um, this was in the beginning of her, uh, her term that she, that she did this. Um, a number of reality checks have since appeared that made it perhaps more difficult for her to immediately see a, a way through the implementation of the entire report. But I'm, it's important to realize that that was the mindset she was in when we started. So we started on a very positive note, but we knew that the challenges would be enormous and that there are no instant solutions. There are four factors, I think, that affected our work. And let me say that, you know, as part of our work, we interviewed well over 1,000 people. We traveled, you know, from north to south, from, from Mandau down to Tandwe and, and Napoli uh, in Rakhine State. Um, we talked with people everywhere and of all ethnicities. Um, the first important factor that affected our work was that six weeks after we started, <coughs> we had you know, the situation of 9 October 2016 when armed attacks on security personnel in Maungau district led to loss of life, life amongst uh, members of the security forces. Subsequently, there were so-called intensive clearance operations, which really resemble a scorched earth, earth policy. Uh, and as a result of these attacks and their aftermath, not only did we not have as much opportunities as we would have liked to have had to travel um, to uh, Mangdao district, um, but as a result of those attacks, the fear of Rohingya and Rakhine of each other grew exponentially which made it more difficult for us to get buy-in for far-reaching recommendations to reconcile the communities. A second um, complication was that some stakeholders rejected us from the beginning. Uh, you know, lawmakers from the Arakan National Party and the US USDP sought to abolish the commission completely, and they put forward a motion in the union parliament. That failed, but because the NLD had the majority there. But a similar motion in the Rakhine Parliament succeeded, and subsequently, many uh, uh, of many of of the politicians of Rakhine State um, boycotted us, at least officially. In the end, we somehow managed to speak with many of them anyway, but uh, not officially. Third complication is really the governance structure, the governance structure in which, under the 2000. Eight constitution provides for a high degree of autonomy for the armed forces. And this made the search for a coherent and harmonized policy to deal with all the problems all the more challenging. And you have to realize that, you know, um, the NLD um, does not have much, much support in the, in, in the, in the um, city parliament. Um, it, it doesn't have. Uh, it, it has a number of seats there, but it does not have a majority. So, its 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 um, influence there is limited. And at the same time, there is a huge presence of um, security forces, and 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 has been over the past couple of decades there. And the way the um, 
the system works is that um, the civil service in a state like Rakhine comes not comes under the general affairs department of home affairs. That department is um, one of the departments that is headed by the military. So the entire civil service you deal with knows where their pay is coming from. That doesn't mean that they don't think or don't try to be helpful, but you know, it's a factor. And fourth, I think, was the lack of meaningful devolution from the union capital to the state authorities. But kind state's government has really very limited authority to deal even with day-to-day -day management issues. Um, and that, that means that for a lot of things, not only they, but also we had to go back to Naypyidaw all the time to explain the difficulty to, to try to find our way forward. Now, Burma watchers have made a lot of the fact that we identified 88 recommendations. That was purely coincidental. Um, but they did cover, um, and if they think that that's a lucky figure, you know, all the better for us. But they covered a, a wide range of topics, including economic and social development, citizenship, freedom of movement, education, health, security sector, uh, reform, access to justice, and so on. But we also included some recommendations about more immediate short-term issues linked to significant problems, linked to the significant problems in the northern Rakhine state. And these included immediate and unfettered humanitarian access to aid dependent communities that had not been served for months, as well as uh, immediate media access. And, and as you know, this is still highly problematic at the moment, both, both humanitarian access as well as media access. It's difficult to say what the most important recommendations are because the report has many different stakeholders and what is of critical importance to one may be of less or of no interest to others. If you were to ask the ethnic Rakhine population what they find most important, they would probably point to the economic and social recommendations. To them, these are recognition of their deliberate and prolonged marginalization by successive military regimes. Land issues, in particular, have caused serious um, grievances, but also the lack of any significant government investment in infrastructure, in education, and in job creation. And it is very sad that at present, some 30% of all young Rakhines leave the state every year to, meet, to make a living elsewhere. There is no future for them there. Um, so it is... Um, a, a, a marginalized uh, population and what you sometimes see with marginalized populations if they cannot engage with those who they think oppress them they tend to look at those that they can you know uh, deflect their grievances to and that in many ways has been the Rohingya population if you were to ask the Rohingya about what, is the most, what are the most important uh, recommendations in our report for them, they will probably say uh, the issues relate to citizenship. And, you know, uh, they're de facto, not de jure, because, you know, once you have citizenship, you don't simply lose it unless there is a deliberate act of the state to take it away from you. But their de facto statelessness has been abused to deprive hundreds of thousands of their rights in a very arbitrary and discriminatory manner. Um, and, and after decades of gradual loss of an official identity, the final blow came in 2005 when the government invalidated all tempor temporary citizenship cards. And this for many Rohingya was the last bit of evidence they had of their claim to citizenship. At the same time, they were also denied the vote in the, 12, in the 2015 elections. Since 2012, that lack of confirmed citizenship status has been used to put some 120,000 uh, Rohingya and Kaman Muslims, the Kaman Muslims is a small minor, minority who are different because they have citizenship. Um, they have also been put in open air camps that really uh, in many ways resemble detention center centers. 
while others, you know, found themselves confined to their villages, particularly in Maungang district, losing their access to land, to livelihoods, to fishing and trading areas. Um, the state councillor accepted our recommendations on 25th of August, and that's the same day that the new violence broke out and the exodus um, of now uh, 655,000 people started. I think generally our report has been well received with many actually telling us that it exceeded expectations. Um, but, you know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. It has to be implemented. It, it, it's, it, isn't, it certainly isn't perfect, but we chose to squarely address a number of sensitive issues because we believed that if we didn't, they would be left to fester um, in the, the future of not only Rakhine, but also the future of the state of Myanmar itself. I'll come back to that later. Um, follow-up, a bit about the follow-up. Of course, many people say that our recommendations were not written for the situation that developed from 25 August on, onwards. That's true. But that doesn't mean that the report has become irrelevant. On the contrary, I would even say that it's become more relevant and more urgent. First, because it contains a shared perspective on, on the underlying causes of the present situation. Uh, no one has challenged our analysis that the Rakhine state suffers from a very pernicious mix of underdevelopment, intercommunal conflict, and the lingering grievance of of, of uh, all communities um, to the central government. We have an identified in our report three major crises, a human rights crisis, a security crisis, and a development crisis. They have to be addressed simultaneously. Choosing, as some suggest, to start with economic development only will backfire. That is not the choice that should be made. Secondly, the report has continued relevant because our conclusions and recommendations are directed and relevant for all communities in that state. Be they Rakhine, Rohingya, Kaman, Nuru, um, Marimaji, the Hindu community, all of them. And we have interacted with all of them. Um, thirdly, many of our recommendations are immediately relevant for the debate that needs to be started uh, as soon as possible. The debate about how to create conditions, the conditions needed to ensure a voluntary, secure, dignified, and sustainable return of the refugees who are now in Bangladesh. Uh, I remember one refugee saying simply, you know, we want to have a life, implying that the conditions uh, that he and his family fled were not only horrific, were not only horrific as a result of the 25 August attacks, but also that the general living conditions had become unbearable. And here, in this connection, I want to mention a report that was published in November, so after our report appeared, and I really wish we had had that report at the time. It is. Amnesty International's report entitled Caged Without a Roof, Apartheid in Myanmar's Rakhine State. It is based on years of research and it gives you, and you really should read it, an indispensable overview of what has been happening and particularly since the intercommunal violence of 2012 when the authorities started to enforce, enforce a strict system of segregation on the basis of ethnicity. I have seen with my own uh, eyes how pernicious and far-reaching that system has become. And also how, as a result of that system of strict segregation, the fear of Rakhine and Rohingya of each other has grown ex exponentially. If you don't know your neighbor, if you never meet, if you don't if you, your economic interactions are vastly reduced, uh, you fear grows beyond rational. And I've often said also to my, colleague, my, 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 my colleagues from Myanmar and to others in the country that 
looking at this system and thinking of Europe, it reminds me of what in my lifetime we witnessed in the Balkans and in Northern Ireland. It, they have great difficulty understanding that. that that's clear because you know they, they don't know as much about the Balkans as, as, as I do. But it set, does set some of them thinking. And particularly those who deny, and there are many that I've met who deny that, that there's anything wrong. The, the, the numbers of people who told me, but you know they are in these camps for their own security, is countless. Um, so it's a mindset that really needs to sh change. Interestingly, um, Amnesty speaks of an apartheid-like system characterized by a strong state role in enforcing systemic discrimination and ethnic segregation. And it's true that almost every institution of Rakhine State, whether it is a district township or at the state level itself, is involved in the enforcement of that pernicious system. It's happened very quickly from 2012 to 2017. It was very solid and it benefits uh, a lot of people in terms of bribe, in, in bribes, in terms of illegal fees that uh, the Rohingya have have to pay in order to access even the most basic services. It is essential also that this report by Amnesty gets more exposure, particularly because it explores legal remedies that no one I know had thought of before. Um, it explores these legal remedies under three international agreements that prohibit and criminalize apartment. There is the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, the 1993 Convention Against Apartheid and um, the Statute of the ICC all have these kinds of um, these kinds of um, uh, provisions. Uh, and it's interesting that, that the discussion internationally, as well as 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 um, within the country itself, has mostly focused on the attacks and the subsequent, uh, and the subsequent uh, let me say, scorched earth, earth policy by uh, the, um, the armed forces. That is one thing, but there is, you know, putting people under conditions similar to apartheid that no one has really thought of as looking into to, to see whether actually a case can be built to, uh, um, to uh, to try to bring those responsible to account, or you know, if that's not possible, at least to raise awareness that this has to stop. Um, as you know, Bangladesh and Myanmar have signed an agreement that lays out some principles for return. It's clear that it falls short of international stand standards. And our report contains a lot of the conditions that need to be addressed in order to move towards a situation of a greater peaceful co to coexistence. Uh, it's going to take a long time, but it needs to be, um, but it needs to be done. Um, let me finish. Um, I just want to quickly mention three that, that are most important. The closure of all camps that have housed uh, both um, uh, Kaman and Rohingya IDPs under conditions resembling detention, easing the restrictions on the freedom of movement and ensuring equal rights for all who live in Rakhine State, because what you find is that Rakhine State, but people, these stateless people don't have rights. That's not true. Stateless people do have rights. Um, and the last is a, a credible process of citizenship verification as well as the urgent need to revisit the 1982 law that restricts citizenship to a limited number of ethnicities. Uh, it, it actually allows discrimination on the basis of race. We also made some recommendations for a follow-up mechanism to the report, and um, the Myanmar government has decided to establish another advisory commission with mixed Myanmar international uh, membership to advise uh, on, on follow-up. Uh, an implementation. I know they are getting ready, ready to prepare for their first visit, and uh, I wish them every success. Finally, and I think 
it is, you cannot look, and I looked at the title of the public forum, it says Myanmar's Rohingya Rakhine crisis. Is it really a Rohingya Rakhine crisis, or is it a crisis that goes to the heart of the problem of Myanmar as a whole? The politics of identity, the politics of minorities, the dominant role of the Bamar, unaccountable armed forces, a continuing military industrial complex, uh, highly centralized decision making are just some of the characteristics that in the academic literature you find listed as characteristics of, of a failing, uh, of the of state that's at risk of failing. One of the things I think that is most needed is an honest national debate about what it means to be a Myanmar citizen in the 21st century. The present politics of identity and ethnicity have stifled such a debate, and they are holding the country back. It's important to, to recognize that Myanmar emerged from World War II not as a nation, but as a state divided. Its nation building process is not near completion. It has a long way to go, and the immediate reflex of many in the country is to look back into history. History is essential, history is important. It defines societies and informs identity, but it should not hold the country back from facing a common future. Thank you. Thank you. That's, uh, that's why ranging uh, incisive. I think you covered a lot of ground, uh, even centuries. Um, I have a, just a quick question. Uh, Ambassador, you know, there are a lot of labeling and uh, headlines, and uh, this has been uh, called uh, genocide. Uh, ethnic cleansing was taking place in uh, Rakhine with the Rohingyas. You mentioned uh, apartheid and uh, this strict uh, segregation, which is pernicious. You mentioned it a couple of times. How would you characterize this, this crisis, this violence and conflict in, conflict in Rakhine State involving the, these uh, Rohingyas? Would it be kind of a uh, apartheid, uh, uh, enforced segregation, or w w how would you call this? It is enforced. Seg it, it is enforced segregation. I mean, the two things there are is the situation, the living conditions that have uh, started to become the norm since 2012. Uh, everything that I have seen, and certainly everything else that's in the well-researched Amnesty reports, um, points to enforced ethnic uh, segregation. Then there is the other side, which is whether what the alleged crimes committed both after uh, 25 August and after uh, 9 October of last year. Um, there, um, you have to be careful, because uh, if you talk about genocide, genocide is a, um, has legal definitions, and it, it's ultimately only up to uh, a court of law to decide what or not has taken place. Um, I, 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 it, it's very clear that, that uh, UN Secretary General um, Guterres has uh, spoken of ethnic cleansing. So have many others. I think the only president I've heard speaking about genocide is um, President Macron of France. He was very clear in that. Um, and, you know, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Prince Zaid, has said, also very carefully, he doesn't say it's a genocide because he knows that he cannot determine that, but there are elements in the behavior of the armed forces that could be seen as a part of a genocidal pattern. Um, but you have to be very careful with that. You know, we don't, I mean, the biggest problem is that there is no independent access. The UN has established a, a fact-finding mission, um, by the way, not only looking into the situation in Rakhine State, but also in, 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 in uh, Kachin and Rakhine, uh, in, the, in the, north, uh, the northeast. Um, but they have not been given access. Doesn't mean that you cannot do quite a lot without having access. There are good examples of that uh, in international uh, practice. But it would have been much better um, if there had been access. Because, and uh, frankly, also in the interest of, 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 of the government itself, because there are lots of rumors swirling around 
uh, which we don't know uh, whether they're true. Some of them, you know, um, are uh, ballooning out of proportion, and it's in the interest of the government, actually, to to allow access to deflect uh, situations in which, uh, you know, the news is not uh, that news that is reported is not correct. Um, okay, thank you very much. That's one thing I think that uh, uh, is conspicuous: the absence of a, a government. Uh, organization or some kind of a media team to, to, to convey their messages.